Welcome to The Joe Cohen Show. Join me as I share my experience with biohacking and invite top health experts to explore the latest technology, supplements, research, and resources for optimizing your body and brain. Hey, everyone. I am here with Alex Leaf, who has a master's degree in nutrition from Bastards University, and he's been writing about the science of nutrition, health, and fitness for over a decade. Currently, he's a content creator alongside uh, Ari Witten at the Energy Blueprint, and he was formerly a senior writer at Examine and a teaching assistant at the University of Western States in human nutrition and functional medicine I've have, I'm bringing him on the podcast here because he's been doing research on supplements, nutrition for quite a while, and I feel like he's gained quite a lot of knowledge, and I want to get his take on what makes, what he thinks has the best research, what he takes, why does he take things, and what he thinks is the most promising from all the research that he's done. So uh, I think the more viewpoints we could get, the the better it is. So thanks for coming on, Alex. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. So let's get right into it. First, uh, a question I'd like to ask is, how did you get started in health? Was it through trying to optimize or you had certain health issues? What got you into health? Yeah. Uh, so ever since I was um, very young, uh, like second grade in elementary school, I had done competitive wrestling and I did that all the way up through college. And ultimately I developed uh, bulimia because of it and um, body dysmorphia. Okay. And I really wanted to get over uh, this uh, eating disorder and the anxiety with it um, by myself. So what actually got me started into everything uh, was reading Mark Sisson's blog, The the Daily Apple. Um, I think that's what it's called. Um, but that's what got me interested in nutrition to begin with. And from there, I became involved at my university in like various health clubs and personal training um, and ultimately just started connecting with people online. Uh, who helped me better understand the literature and mentor me uh, to an extent. Um, some of them actually hired me to write blogs on their websites, uh, which helped me kind of hone both my writing and my research skills in terms of locating and communicating the scientific literature. And all of that eventually got me spotted by the... Um, by Kamal Tell at examine.com. And they wanted to hire me to be one of their writers for the uh, research digest, um, which is now called The Nerd. Uh, so I was one of the first writers on that. And I did that for about two years while simultaneously getting my master's degree in nutrition. And, um, and then, you know, once I got my master's degree, they wanted me to be a full-time researcher. So they hired me on and I did that for several more years. Um, at which point I uh, eventually left them to work alongside Ari Witten. Um, and I did some teaching at the university level during this time, uh, specifically for exercise metabolism and sports nutrition. Um, and now I'm, I'm here and I continue to do, uh, reading and writing about nutrition research, supplement research and health research of all kinds. Okay. Um, so now what areas are you trying to improve currently? What are, do you have like a list of topics that you're trying to improve or you feel like you've made significant improvements in the, uh, body dysmorphia that, you know, or, or are you still trying to improve on that? Yeah. So every, everything has been resolved. Um, I would say that that body dysmorphia it, it is something that never, never really goes away, but you just learn to, um, challenge the thoughts that you have and realize that, uh, you know, they, you don't need to follow those thoughts. 
um, and you can recognize that they don't necessarily ref reflect reality. Uh, but the eating disorder has certainly gone away um, years and years ago. Uh, and the body dysmorphia is just, um, it, it just exists. You know, I, I will never be happy with my body unless I, I am just absolutely shredded to like unhealthy levels. Um, I spent, uh, probably a good three years of my life just at consistently around five to 6% body fat. Um, which was uh in incredibly unhealthy for a variety of reasons uh but i i eventually got out of that and allowed myself to gain weight um and allowed myself to gain body fat and i've just kind of been holding on to that as a uh as a way to overcome this idea that you know i need to be state like bodybuilding stage lean all the time to to be worthy so to speak what, um, what's your percentage body fat right now uh right now i'm probably around 14 okay, percent um that, that's around where i am yeah and i think that for men i think uh anywhere between 12 and 15 percent is healthy for 99 percent of individuals um i think that there are some genetic uh lucky people that could probably be in the eight to twelve percent range and maintain most of their health you know uh have their body not think that they're starving so to speak but that's that's not the majority um yeah i, I don't know how lucky they are either though because if they get sick they need yeah. body fat in order to buffer them against yep the calorie loss or they probably can't fast as well without burning muscle becoming or yeah or becoming more moody and irritable yeah yeah so i don't yeah, so, I, I wouldn't i wouldn't know if it's a gift per se <laughs> yes yeah, it's, that's it's true. it comes with pros and cons but uh did you check your body fat with like a dexa or are you just yep. estimating okay, always so did i and you came out at 14 i came out at 15 actually well yeah mine was like 14.3 um okay and i think the highest i've ever been was at 17 point something percent but when i when i saw that result uh i was like okay well i need a diet so then so, i i lost some weight and i would agree with you by the way about that ideal percentage 12 to 15 percent. i was thinking about that i think that is a, a good amount where you could yeah. look quite muscular mm -hmm. but you still have those fat reserves and you don't have your body like you said your body doesn't think you're in starvation it's a it's a you look healthy at that yeah point where yeah. i think these bodybuilders it it just doesn't look healthy right they don't pass no. the look test <laughs> no it's like this guy doesn't look healthy i don't know you know or if i see yeah if, if i see like below 10 percent, it's like this person does not look healthy i don't know whatever I, and i think that's probably one of the best tests uh out there right if somebody looks healthy or doesn't look healthy yeah there's there's something to that yeah. And uh, as far as being super lean goes too, I think a lot of people, uh, I, I don't necessarily think it gets talked about a lot, uh, like what we're doing right now, mainly because, um, most of the issues that occur when you're too lean, people tend to be embarrassed about like, uh, low, lib low libido and erectile dysfunction. Right. Um, I mean, erectile dysfunction, for example, already affects, uh, two thirds of the population um on a semi-regular basis uh and it, that's normal like your your people have stressful lives you know anything can shut down your desire to your body's desire to reproduce uh is it that things, much two-thirds yeah wow. um and and it's I'm not trying to say that that's normal, but it it is a product of I think the modern environment that we're in for a potpourri of reasons, you know, of super big ones simply being stress. Because in order to get an erection, you need to be in a parasympathetic dominant state. Um, and so if you're walking around with chronically elevated cortisol and adrenaline spikes every now and then, 
that's not a signal for you to get an erection that turns it off. Um, right. It's what people are dealing with. And then uh, if you're too lean, you're physiologically chronically stressed. If you're too lean, you're going to be sympathetic dominant. And that's why you're going to have, you know, issues with uh, sexual function. But no one wants to talk about that because it's embarrassing. You know, um, people like will uh, have in the past sent me messages privately asking questions about this because it's something that that they want more information about how to resolve in a healthy way through diet and supplements. But, you know, it, it is it is a private thing that that um, people don't like talking about, even though I feel like most people could probably relate and be like, yeah, I've had that happen to me before and it sucks. Uh, right. Have you, yeah. it, w with your body dysmorphia issues, I mean, I have kind of a theory and um, I'm curious what you think about it. I, I kind of think of it as more of, uh, it's under the umbrella of anxiety and mood disorders, right? And I think it's just, it's, it's a mood disorder that kind of manifests in a different way than maybe some other mood disorders, right? And so what I'm, I'm thinking about is, um, have you, how many, like, have you tried to go at it as a mood disorder and like try things that are good for anxiety or mood, or you've just thought of it as, um, I need to just, you know, change my, the way I'm thinking about it. Uh, yeah, I have, I have gone about it from, um, a, a mood standpoint and I've, I've done everything, uh, including microdosing psilocybin, um, or more, uh, accurately mini dosing it. Um, and it, it persists. I, uh, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with the idea that body dysmorphia would qualify as a mood disorder simply because um, changes in one's mood are a symptom of the dysphoria uh, rather than being the dysphoria itself. I think that it is simply uh, people holding unrealistic expectations about their body and seeing things uh, from their own unique perspective that, that other individuals do not share. So well, whereas, let me clarify a little bit. I, I yeah. would see that, uh, I don't think it's a disorder per se, right? I, I kind of think of it in a similar vein to self-esteem. If you have a, if somebody has a low self-esteem in, in a general sense, doesn't mean they have a mood disorder or doesn't mean they have anxiety per se, but and, and I don't think if somebody has a low self-esteem, then you go to the doctor and they're going to be like, okay, you need an SSRI or whatever. But I do think that there is a neurochemical, there can be, right? I mean, there, it could be like somebody's just putting them down in their environment all day or something of that nature. But I think, you know, uh, in the vast majority of times, there's some kind of neurochemical imbalance. And so I would say that it's, is that a disorder if somebody has a low self-esteem? Absolutely not. But I think it's a neurochemical imbalance of sorts. And I'm wondering if that's something that you could change uh, in through changing your neurochemistry. And from my, you know, from my own personal experience, I've noticed that when my mood changes, the, my self-esteem changes. So if my mood is worse, my self-esteem will get worse. I'll start to doubt myself. Whereas, and again, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that I have clinical depression or a depressive disorder, but it does mean that I have, you know, uh, it, it, there's definitely some kind of neurochemical imbalance there uh, and, and, and ways to optimize it. So I'm curious if you've tried increasing serotonin and seeing how it helped, let's say, with uh, the, the, the body dysmorphia, which I, would, I wouldn't say it's a disorder, but I would say it's more close to a self-esteem kind of uh, level. Yeah, I think. Um, I think, uh, matching it to self-esteem is certainly a more accurate way of looking at it. And I, I have done things to increase serotonin and I, much like what you just said, when I am in a better mood overall, I don't care. Um, it doesn't affect me to the same extent. Um, I, 
but uh, I, I think of it as a two-way street because someone could be in a really good mood, but if they have very, very deep disbeliefs about their own body or their own self-esteem, that could then drive a reduction in their mood state, um, even if they started in a good mood. And so I, I completely agree that neurochemicals and an imbalance in neurochemicals could drive uh, those negative self-talk and that negative behavior that follows. Um, I do think too that negative self-talk could impact neurotransmitters and impact uh, the mood state of someone. Um, I think a really good uh, example of this is when you're dealing with something like psychedelics, which we could say are the the kind of extreme serotonin uh, mimetic, um, set and setting are super important. So if somebody just does a full-blown trip on psychedelics, they could have a super magical experience if they're already in the right headspace. But if their thoughts are incredibly negative and they're in a very you know, hostile environment, if they're set and setting are messed up, then all of that serotonin could actually perpetuate this negativity going on and they could have a really, really bad trip. Um, so these neurochemicals, I, uh, I think more than anything, they amplify the thoughts and the beliefs that you already have. And okay. so, you know, if, if we take it to the extreme, if we deplete serotonin in somebody, they'll show depressive behaviors because you need serotonin to, to regulate your mood state. Um, but if, you know, someone is, is sad or, or depressed and you give them more serotonin, it's not guaranteed to pull them out of that. Can right. it play a role and can it save some people? Yeah, definitely, because it really depends on what's causing it to begin with. Right. So I think uh, it's very personal. I, I think part of the issue with mood in general is there's many different mechanisms by which yes. mood is working. And I think when it comes to serotonin as well, there's many different ter serotonin receptors and mm -hmm. there's many different parts in the brain where serotonin can be working. Yep. So one supplement or drug could be working in one way. And I think that, uh, you know, SSRIs are going to work differently than a lot of either mm -hmm. natural stuff or even 5-HTP because it's blocking the reuptake of serotonin. It's actually not increasing the full like the original building blocks of ser serotonin, which is the 5-HTP or tryptophan. And yeah. so these things are working in, there, there could be, when you say serotonin, there could be many, many different kinds of serotonin, where it's working, you know, it could be increasing serotonin in the gut and not the brain, theoretically. Yep. It could be, and I, I think when, you know, I, I've been experimenting with a lot of serotonin stuff. And so, I think when it comes to, let's say, uh, you gave the example with psychedelics and increasing serotonin, that's a very particular thing with psychedelics. I don't mm -hmm. find the same thing with 5-HTP, actually. So if yeah. I take psychedelics, set and setting is going to matter significantly, right? If, if you're in a very anxious state, it can heighten anxiety a bit. Um, and, and it also depends on the dosing. I feel like that's more the case with higher mm -hmm. dosing rather than mini dosing or micro dosing. Um, but, you know, the, the psychedelics also do a lot of other things and those specific receptors are very different. So normally if you just increase serotonin, it doesn't hit those receptors in the same way. It's like very, very specific uh, way that, that psychedelics work. And so with 5-HTP, I found, what, what I find is that you're right that uh, self, if you have a external stimuli, it could then cause a, you know, self-esteem to lower or, or cause changes in your neurochemistry. But I found what that does is it just makes the threshold of serotonin that you need higher for me personally, right? I'm not, I'm not saying this is true for everybody. So I have not found yet that if my serotonin is high enough, that my self-esteem could be low, uh, even no matter what is going on in, in the background. It's and 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 there's a there's a number of things that do it. Five HTP is one of them. 
uh, resistant starch and butyrate uh, is is another one. Basically, like it can completely reverse the effects, and and so I'm. It's pretty much not possible as long as I'm taking those things to have a low self esteem. Now I can't say, obviously that you know it's not going to be a hundred percent effective in everybody. But what I'm, I think that uh, there's probably you know, things that are increasing serotonin in other parts of the brain that might be more specific to body dysmorphia or I don't know, right? I I I'm, I might be talking out of my ass also, but uh, it, no, that's, that's kind no. of where I'm coming from is that I think I'm kind of looking at it from a personal perspective where I've been able to, even under high stress or high pressure, basically just take care of any kind of uh, like, negative thoughts that that would normally come through and i i just haven't found that um like kind of changing your thinking it doesn't work in the same way so i could change my thinking but it's st i'm still going to get that kind of negative mood and then it's basically like my body kind of even if i don't try to change my thinking it kind of just i start talking to myself and reasoning through it and then I think your body just goes through a natural wave, right? You're, very few people are depressed all the time or happy all the time. It just ends up going through a wave anyway. Uh, but I find that when my serotonin is high enough, it doesn't go through that wave. It's just always, it's more at an even state. Yeah, so I think you're approaching uh, this in the way that, that it should be approached. Um, and that is saying that Hey, we have all of this scientific data um, that's looking at serotonin and how serotonin works in the body from, you know, these certain standpoints, like specifically low serotonin is really where a lot of the research focuses. I personally am not aware of any data that looks at uh, what you're describing, like, hey, let's give a bunch of 5-HTP to people and see how their mood state responds. Um, and let's maybe even see if we can get like a dose response study going where there might be a level that's too high, um, et cetera, et cetera. As far as I'm aware, and I stand to be corrected here, uh, that research has never been conducted. So we, no one, no one, uh, can, can say, uh, whether you're talking out of your butt or not. Um, but what does matter are the, the outcomes that you personally are experiencing. So. If you find that, hey, if I'm having a rough day, I just increase my dose of 5-HTP and it helps me get through that. It helps change my mindset around that day because it makes it easier to look at the positive side of things. That's what matters, regardless of, you know, the, the nitty gritty mechanisms around what's really happening inside your brain with the serotonin. Um, what we can say is that you're definitely increasing serotonin with 5-HTP because it bypasses the rate limiting step of serotonin synthesis. Now, right. where in the brain does that 5-HTP and the serotonin it creates concentrate? You know, what centers of your brain are being activated when you take escalating doses? Uh, do certain centers get saturated? Does it help with communication within different regions of your brain, which helps you perspective shift on these issues that are otherwise causing you turmoil? We don't, we don't know all these answers, especially when it comes from a, a supplementation standpoint. But again, the outcome itself is what we care about. You're happier and you're, you, you're not as stressed as a result. That, that's the, what we care about. That's what matters. Right. And, and I kind of think that that's kind of what I'm curious about. And, and I, don't, I don't know, you know this is obviously uh, quite advanced, but I, I do believe that you know, people with maybe different kind of mood related issues can do well with serotonin. But the question is where in the brain and how do you need to go about with that serotonin? Like maybe some people do better just with an SSRI because it increases serotonin in a very specific place. Maybe some people 5-HTP because it saturates it in a very specific place. Whereas other people might do better with ashwagandha or bacopa or some people with rhodiola. And so what I've done actually is, you know, th there's a lot of things that increase serotonin, a lot of natural stuff. I've 
mega dosed each one to see which one works the best for me. And so a lot of those things that increase serotonin, there's a feeling that it increases serotonin, but it's very clear that it's not doing it in the right place as some of the other things. And so it, it, in some way I say, yeah, I could see how this improves my mood, like improves mood in a certain way, but it's very clear that it doesn't take care of that self-esteem, like negative thoughts coming in or, or you know, the, 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 a certain level of the imbalance. Like it might be good as, it, it's just very clear that it's not hitting that right part of the brain. Like I, it feels like it's increasing serotonin. The research says it's increasing serotonin, but it just doesn't feel like it's hitting that right part of the brain. And I bet that it's different for every person. Um, so that's kind of where uh, th that's kind of where I was thinking about it. I wonder, like, have you ever tried mega dosing with a bunch of different things and seeing what hits the spot? Uh, no, I, I would say <laughs> probably the closest I've ever gotten to that is um, I found a really nice ashwagandha supplement that uh was ultra concentrated where um the dose is equivalent to taking like 50 grams of dried ashwagandha root um but what brand point, is it what what like what it's what called extraction? tonic t-o and but is it a specific uh extraction because i know there's like shodan there's one with an s uh i keep on forgetting it sir something no, I don't remember, but Shodan is, so if you look at the extracts, uh, a base root is uh, like less than 1% the withanolides that are the active ingredient. The um, KSM 66 extract is uh, about 5%. Shodan is 30%. Um, but these are just patented extracts. If they, and companies like Tonic don't use them. Uh, if they just show you what their extract potency is. So, um, you know, if a place, a place doesn't need to use them and if it says, you know, concentrated to 20% with analyzes or whatever, then you, you can calculate what the effective dose is really on your own. Um, I, and you also don't have to pay the extra cost to get the patent. So right. things like Shodan are, are great. Uh, but it's no better than a non-patented extract that matches the 30%. Right, right. I, I, I mean, there might be a little bit of a difference. I'm not sure because it's not necessarily just the withanolides, but there's also sensorial. I think the withanolides are a significant component of it, but I, I don't, I'm not sure if it's the only thing. Now, uh, again, I, have a, I actually have a mood supplement. It's called Joe's Mood Daily. It has 5-HTP. It has 10% withanolides. Like I basically put all this stuff that I found work very well for me into one thing. And also some things that even though they, if, even if it didn't work that well for me, it, I noticed it had like, it worked for a lot of other people, which, mm -hmm. uh, for example, theanine, if I take a, I take a large dose or a small dose, don't really feel like I could feel something, but it's like, it's, it doesn't hit the spot for me, but you, you know, there's a lot of research you read on the forums. Like it does help a lot of people. So uh, it's something I put in there, but I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, like some of the key ones for me that really hit the spot are rhodiola with a mm -hmm. higher silidricide count. Yep. Uh, so like 3% silidricides, which, which is what I have in there. Uh, ashwagandha with 10% with, a, with analides. Um, those are, are some good ones. And, and the 5-HCP is, is a really big one for me as well. Uh, yeah. And then the lithium orotate actually uh, through a, uh, the GSKB uh, beta inhibitor pathway, it, it increases serotonin as well. Uh, okay. So it's a little bit indirect. It also is an NMDA receptor antagonist, but essentially uh, those are some of the like very important ones for me. Um, I guess my question is, uh, why have you not tried to megadose? Are you afraid of the side effects or just, you know, doesn't, I've, doesn't resonate with you? Uh, I've, I've actually just never thought of it or considered it um okay yeah my the approach that i've taken with supplements is i will look at the literature as a whole um figure out is this something that i i could expect to benefit me and if so then what is the effective dose the clinical dose that's been used successfully in the literature um and then i usually go with that uh, 
for, and I haven't considered, uh, I haven't really had a need, so to speak, um, for a lot of them to, uh, to do things like acutely enhance mood. So I haven't, uh, had a desire or, or, um, haven't had a necessity to play around with what the right effective dose is. The, the last time I did that, uh, was just over the last several months, uh, playing around with dis different doses of psilocybin to figure out which one, uh, gives me the most jump in my creativity when I take it without, you know, um, Harming making your me... executive function. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and for a lot of products too, I'm, I'm much more interested in, uh, long-term benefits and, uh, benefits that are going to be sub perceptual. So like, how is this going to benefit my brain health over the long term and help offset neurodegeneration that might impact me otherwise? Um, how is something going to uh, affect my athletic performance and my ability to train in the gym um, without me like being incredibly anal, like, okay, I got, you know, one more uh, rep this time. Uh, all else equal. It's like, I just want to go and see, do I feel like I'm able to push heavier weight or go a little harder or go a little longer? Um, something like creatine. I can't say that I've noticed anything from creatine as an example, but I am 100% confident that it is providing me with some type of health benefit. Because even if I am a non-responder to uh, the creatine saturation of muscle tissue, it still has benefits on brain health and it still has benefits on the liver through freeing up a lot of acidenosyl methionine uh, to go methylate other things in the body because 40% of your SAMe in the liver is used in creatine synthesis. If you supplement creatine, your liver stops making it. You free all that up to go methylate other things that need it. Um, the, but maybe your body also reduces the SAMe that it creates. Maybe, uh, but I haven't seen that been demonstrated in the, the creatine literature showing it. Um, okay. the more likely scenario is that that SAMe is used elsewhere and any excess is buffered by glycine, uh, so that your body doesn't over methylate. Um, but then that assumes that you're getting sufficient glycine and I've, I've had individuals that I've worked with when they start supplementing creatine, they actually experience profound anxiety from it. Uh, and as soon as I have them start supplementing gly glycine, uh, all that anxiety goes away. And I think it's just a result of excess methylation uh, driving changes in their mood state. Um, so the and glycine takes care, how does glycine take care of excess methylation? It accepts, uh, um, Except the donor? methyl molecule, yeah, mm. uh, to be transformed into, uh, shoot, I'm going to, I, into serine, I believe. Um, okay. That's fine. Uh, but it basically, it, it, it accepts a methyl. Yep. So if there's, uh, any kind of excess methyl groups, what would happen in a case where there's no glycine? You have too much methyl groups and what happens? Uh, mood disorders, hypermethylation also plays a role in the development of cancer. Um, it uh, also plays a role in cancer prevention, like methylation in general. So, yeah. So with cancer and methylation, it's a bit complicated because hypermethylation can protect against cancer uh, in uh, pro-oncogenes that have not yet been activated because then it shuts them down and prevents mm -hmm. that part from being transcripted. Uh, but, um, it, uh, if those have already been activated, then the hypermethylation can stop the tumor suppressor, suppressing genes ah, from being activated, okay. uh, and let that cancer run wild. And it, no one ever knows, um, <laughs> whether they have cancer or not. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's uh, what stage you're at, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, so it's, it's ideally you don't want to be too little or too much. Um, and the body's generally really good at balancing all of that, assuming you're taking care of it. And so that's, you know, getting sufficient glycine. I, I like to recommend 10 grams per day, either from collagen or as just a free form glycine supplement. 
Do you want to hear about the one health hack that is sure to change your life? Okay, here it is. Subscribing to this podcast. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show, so please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, all while helping to keep us ad-free. Click the subscribe button now and enjoy the rest of the episode. Let, let's go through some of the supplements that you take in general, right? Do you yeah. have a list that you, you've got around or? <laughs> no, I know. I don't have a you list. Just, oh, I uh, so. You got to go rummage through your cabinets where, yeah. or you can know, remember offhand. So I would say that that some of the, the big ones I take are, I, I take a multivitamin specifically. I take um, energy essentials and superfoods, which is uh, a product that uh, I helped formulate through the energy blueprint. Um, okay. And this is just like a general multivitamin that has, uh, you know, the most bioavailable forms of the vitamins and minerals that you need. Um, with a, a whole food emphasis. So it uses methylated folate, folinic acid, uh, the like P5P for B6. Um, Why not methylfolate? It, it uses methylfolate. Folinic acid is, is, is different than methylfolate, it, right? It uses both, yes. Oh, uh, okay. So there's some methylfolate, some folinic acid. Got it. Yeah, so the folinic acid can uh, be more readily converted into... Oh uh, God, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's before methylfolate and it's what's used primarily in purine synthesis uh, in okay. the folate pathway um, because that uses a form of folate that isn't methylated. Um, I, tetrahydrofolate, I believe, just raw tetrahydrofolate. Right. Um, so, and then, it, and then it just has some uh, baby doses of a lot of the most well-researched um, herbs that are in it uh except in the case of spirulina and uh chlorella it uses the lower end of what's been shown to be clinically effective in the literature um okay which is surprising frankly uh with something like spirulina uh two grams per day has been shown to for example lower blood lipids in people with elevated blood lipids by 20 to 30 percent um I started taking spirulina for that reason. I take three grams a day. Yeah. No, the stuff's great. Uh, effective dose range is really um, like two to 10 grams uh, with six to eight kind of being like the more guaranteed to give you the benefits. Um, so yeah, okay. I take that as a general safety net just to make sure I'm I'm getting everything without... Uh, uh, in case I come up short in my diet for whatever reason. Um, why, why is there, uh, I, I'm just looking at the formula. Why is there benfotiamine in there instead of, how, how does benfotiamine differ from just regular thiamine? Because thiamine reaches the brain. And if you take it every day, you you should be getting enough in the brain. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, it. So... I w I'm not going to be able to tell you the specific mechanism, but when you look at thiamine supplementation research, uh, the benfothiamine uh, has potential benefits for peripheral uh, nerve health. So it's been used to help reduce pain in people with peripheral neuropathy uh, that hasn't been shown to occur with regular thiamine. And our rationale for putting it in there is that it is doing something in the periphery that the regular form cannot itself achieve. And so we say, why not? Um, we might as well use okay. this form that might have potential additive benefits instead. Um, and that's, that's literally the rationale in there. Potential benefit, not really any risk of harm with doing it. So let's just use that form instead. Okay. And what about um, niacinamide instead of just nicotinic acid? Uh, niacinamide is just more likely to be shuttled into the methylation pathway of the liver and form NAD. Um, so nicotinic acid requires extra steps 
to be transformed into niacinamide before that can itself be turned into NAD. Uh, and so since we're using a low dose of niacin, we figure we might as well just have it all go shuttled towards the NAD itself. Um, if okay. you're using niacin for blood lipid control, or uh, if you're looking to debate the peripheral nicotinic acid receptors, then yeah, you need to use nicotinic acid for that in higher doses. Um, and that has benefit I, I, you get with niacinamide. Right. I, I think there's some benefits with the nicotinic acid, even though there's another, like it does have to hit, go through the niacinamide to uh, increase the NAD. Um, I, I think there's benefits to the immune system in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, that's kind of why I prefer, but obviously you also get the flushing, right? So, yeah. So our goal slow with this isn't to, uh, really just provide, you know, benefits with all the benefits that are possible with all the different forms of niacin. It's just to give people that kind of, uh, a safe intake level that can help facilitate the primary purpose of niacin. What are the, some of the things that you take in high dosages separately, let's say, or, or reasonable yeah. dosages. Yeah. So every day I take 20 grams of hydrolyzed collagen for it supplies glycine. Okay. Uh, it's beneficial for skin and joint health. Uh, and the literature is pretty clear uh, that the collagen peptides are what drive the benefits in joint and skin health. And that these benefits are not obtained by simply eating other forms of protein. Um, okay. Now that collagen isn't going to drive muscle protein synthesis, so it can't be used for as like a primary protein source. But it, I, I, I think of it like uh, sand in a jar. If you have a jar and you fill it with big rocks that are like your, your good sources of protein, like your animal protein or your protein powders or even protein from a variety of plants, uh, you fill up this jar to meet your daily requirements, but you still have all this, like these gaps around these rocks, collagen by supplying, uh, amino acids that are not present in high amounts, um, in other proteins like glycine and hydroxyproline, uh, and by supplying actual peptides specific to collagen, uh, it fills up these gaps and really just completes the body by giving it everything it needs. So interesting. Yeah. 20 Let's grams. See, I'm curious how many uh, benefits offhand without looking up you can kind of think about for glycine while you take it. I'm just curious, like. For glycine or for collagen? Yeah, for glycine. For glycine specifically, uh, it's necessary for the synthesis of glutathione. And it, in fact, uh, uh, the um, you can measure glycine deficiency by measuring urine levels of that. Um, Thing that starts with an O, uh, which is when your body cannot actually complete glutathione synthesis. So, uh, so glutathione is one of the first things your body stops making when you're low in, in glycine. Uh, okay. Long, long term effects are you need glycine to create collagen all throughout the body, which makes up 80% of the protein in the body. So, that's going to have detriments on your skin your bones, thinking like osteoporosis for skin, thinking like wrinkling and lower hydration and elasticity. Um, and then just your joints and ligaments, you're going to need collagen in order to keep those strong. Uh, okay. And then, of course, just the general structure of every cell. They all use collagen-based filaments to hold cell structure. Uh, Glycine is also needed to help your body balance methylation, although... You know, most people undermethylate rather than overmethylate. So this is not a concern for most people. Um, I would argue it's a big concern for most health focused people because they're so focused on avoiding undermethylation that, you know, they might be overmethylating uh, without the ability to let the body buffer that. Right. Uh, and uh, it's also required in creatine synthesis if you, um, aren't supplementing creatine. Uh, if you are, then that really doesn't matter. And I think that's all I can think of off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, uh, that's, that's not bad, by the way. I mean, it's pretty good. But I, I'll tell you, uh, 
like because I have a list, <laughs> I've got funny <laughs> things on my list. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I, I actually wanted to see because I would probably remember a similar amount as you did. And then I'm like thinking, I want to see what happens you know, how many he can name and then like, look at my list. <laughs> you yeah. Know? And there's like four times as many. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, yeah. So what I have that... is, uh, I'll quickly list off what I have. Cardiovascular disease. So it helps a bunch of things in cardiovascular disease, uh, like homocysteine, blood pressure, LDL, HDL, ApoB, uh, lifespan. There's, there's a, uh, effect on lifespan actually. Kidney health. It increases the uh, glomerular filtration rate and uh, reduces uric acid actually uh, mood so it increases GABA wakefulness uh, people were more awake uh, the next day especially if they were sleep deprived um, uh, gut obviously so it's an anti-inflammatory helps with intestinal permeability cognitive function including the NMDA receptors myelin neuroplasticity uh, reduces glucose, blood glucose, helps with sleep, inflammation, uh, mitochondria, uh, and and it, uh, also as part of that, glutathione, oxidative stress, energy with the increases creatine, folate metabolism. I have, you mentioned skin and bones, so that's true. Cavities, even uh, uh, potentially thyroid hormones, and then uh, liver as well. and you know, because I th uh, it's going to increase GGT because of the effect on glutathi glutathione synth synthesis. Uh, and then it also uh, helps balance, it increases T regulatory cells, which is um, basically like it helps with immune tolerance that you're not as kind of uh, uh, intolerant to either your own body or external uh, or uh, proteins or things like that. So that's like the difference between, you know, if I ask, why am I taking glycine again? Yeah. You know, I'm like, that's oh, like, okay, yeah. I see this whole list here. Now we're talking, right? Yeah. I, I hit in fairness, I could be like, give me one sec. I, I wrote about this at one point. Let me go find it. And then I'll have a, a Google doc. Um, but, but that yeah, doesn't, the, the only problem with that is it doesn't show you all the things, all the reasons why you would want to take it. Exactly. Right. Yeah, it's no, just all I the think, reasons why anybody might want to take it. Yeah, and I think that you, uh, I want to going back real quick to when you were describing your process. I think that's a brilliant uh, and systematic way of doing it for the individual, and I think that's a good way for for really anyone, including myself, to approach it. Um, <laughs> the way I got into most of my supplements wasn't by starting with some health goal. It was because uh, somebody wanted me to research it for some reason, whatever that was. And then I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. Like I want to start this. Um, so yeah. Uh, I bet that happens a lot. You start researching something yeah. and you're like, Hey, why am I not taking this? <laughs> yeah, it, it really does. Um, there, there's a lot of incredible compounds out there. I think that, that people just aren't aware of. And unfortunately, I think that there is really a huge push against supplements by uh what i would call the conventional uh medicine system um where people treat supplements like they're they're garbage and they're a waste of money and you know you have on the one side you know take these drugs instead they're better when you know that's not often the case or on the other side you have people that say you don't need all these supplements like just get your diet on point and your lifestyle and the, you don't need the supplements. And it's like, well, that's, that's not true either. Like, right. There, there's definitely a middle ground and it depends on the person. For sure. And, you know, by the way, um, even stuff like, like, I, I completely agree with you that there's so many things out there. People will have no idea how much they can impact an area of their life. I really think like people are walking around blind. Uh, just even based on my own experience, I've seen, you know, and I think uh, genetics is is a real game changer with that as well. But even just the amount of technologies, the amount of supplements out there, like if you have the right information, you have so many more tools. Think about now versus 30 years ago, right? 
the number of supplements that we have now is probably like, I don't know, 80 times the amount, like literally. Yeah. Well, let's say we yeah, had niacin back then. Okay. That's been around since the 1950s, but <laughs> now we have like 50 different kinds of niacin and dosing and like there's the niacinamide, there's the nicotinic acid, there's the inositol hexaniacinate, there's the slow release, you know, and there's like three different slow releases. There's a dosage and it, it's like a hundred types of niacin out there or whatever. I don't know exact number, maybe 25 or it's just a crazy number of variations that you're like, you could really stuff that we didn't have, you know, back then it was just like, you know, you got this niacin, it's one type of niacin. It's in this dosing. You want it or not, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, yeah. And then yeah. I, you know, and then you have this ever emerging amount of just completely unexpected supplements that never even get a chance to like show their worth because research requires funding, and right. you know that can be really hard to obtain. Uh, one of my favorites being agmatine. I uh, the agmatine you know, is a potent binder of the NMDA receptors in the brain. And it does a whole bunch of really cool stuff in there. There's only been one, one, uh, study that I'm aware of where they give people with drug resistant depression, uh, a couple grams of agmatine every day for, um, four weeks. And, and the researchers literally in their study, they're like the patient showed incontroversial, complete remission of their depression like it just disappeared completely where all conventional drugs had failed and and that's the only st human clinical trial that's ever been conducted on it and i have never seen anything else yet on it and it's like this compound for you know whatever reason could could be the most potent antidepressant compound there is yet we're stuck with this one study showing that in this group of participants it completely completely gets rid of their depression where they go from having severe clinical depression to to literally not having depression on the formal depression like psychological evaluations that are done like they like they it's healed a, so to speak it's interesting that you mentioned that i so i've taken agmatine a while ago and i i didn't take it uh, first of all i just ordered agmatine a couple of days ago um and I, I took it like probably nine years ago and I, I, I stopped taking it because I didn't like my reaction, but I was taking it under a certain, it, it was a different physiological state when I was taking it. I think my brain was working more along the, like I needed glutamate in order to function as well. Uh, and, and those NMDA receptors, I think by blocking those NMDA receptors, it kind of made me like a little too numb, if you will, or just like harmed my cognitive thinking in certain ways whereas my nmda receptors are much better regulated now because i don't have inflammation and you know i basically like re-regulated my brain very well but uh so i kind of want to try that again and see what happens um but the reason i'm taking it and there's a, there's a lot of benefits to it actually but one of the reasons i'm taking it is um uh, to increase uh polyamines like spermidine so, oh. yeah, it actually increases uh, spermidine. Basically, like, spermidine is very expensive. And I think in order to feel something, you need to take a large dosage of it. Like, I only felt something on 10 milligrams. And it's like they're selling it at 1 milligram. And it's like, yeah, it's just that, super yeah. expensive. I'm just like, I want to, like, if, if I need to do that, I'll do it. But I'm like, I want to just figure out, you know, there's obvious precursors in the body. Like increasing SAM E and methylation helps increase uh, polyamines like spermidine, and then uh, so uh, and and then the other one is uh, agmatine, and and there's ornithine as well. So I, I ordered that as well. I looked at it from a a mood standpoint, and so, like another more interesting note was that um, autopsies of people who committed suicide showed that they only had like fifty to sixty percent of the brain. Uh, agmatine levels that healthy controls did um, at the time of death. And so, I mean, when you combine that with the fact that supplementation completely reversed severe clinical depression, it's just really like 
Could it be that uh, we know there's a strong link between depression and neuroinflammation? Could it be that this neuroinflammation drives down agmatine levels and creates this vicious cycle that, you know, the worse it gets, maybe it, it ultimately drives those suicidal ideations. Um, and uh, maybe if we just restore the agmatine, uh, then that could provide people with a symptom buffer while they address the underlying neuroinflammation. I don't know, but uh, seems to think it's worth a shot. Certainly something to investigate, in my opinion. Inter it's it, Agmatine is super interesting. I wonder why it's uh, not more uh, known. Like just looking at certain benefits here, there's cardiovascular. It reduces heart rate, blood pressure, reduces blood glucose improves kidney function, improves neuro, it, it, it's, it's thought of as it, it could be its own neurotransmitter even, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And well, it, it shows that uh, it potentiates opioid analgesia and prevents tolerance to chronic morphine in laboratory rodents, which is quite interesting, <laughs> right? Like prevents tolerance to, to opioids. That's pretty cool. Well, even, uh, if we go beyond just individual supplements that no one knows about, uh, no one knows about like all of the different benefits that supplements they are familiar with might have like, uh, yeah. Glucosamine. Yeah. Is a potent anti-aging supplement. Um, sure. like it's, uh, there's been three studies at a population level that look at what supplements are people in the general pop taking and which ones correlate to longevity. And glucosamine is, is like the only one that actually re retains statistical significant after significance after correcting for all of these potential uh, covariates. Um, That's and the main reason you, I take it. <laughs> yeah, well, you're smart for doing that. Uh, and when you um, have people supplement with it and you, use, and you look at something like their DNA methylation, to determine their their biological age rather than their chronological age, uh, it it takes years off their biological aging profile. Um, Interesting. Through what kind of test? What kind of methylation test? Do you believe in? There's so many like aging tests that I I feel like it's they're probably like there's probably something to all of them. But like testosterone is an aging test. <laughs> you know, just get your blood <laughs> tested right. for testosterone, right? Anything that goes down over time that is associated with aging, I mean, like, if you've got white hairs, that's an aging test. How many white hairs do you have, right? Yeah, um, yes. What's your DHEA levels at? What's your, like, I can name, you know, what's your heart rate variability? Anything that is going down over time or whatever goes up, go down, whatever, it's changing over time in a steady way that is kind of like based on that you could uh, predict aging. VO2 max, I mean, like, yeah. There's, I can name a whole bunch of, so I'm sure there's like, you know, telomere length, then you've got like these glycation uh, products that are measuring age and just looking at random blood tests, I'm sure you could get something. Yeah, I never I, thought I, about yeah. that, but that's a really good point. Um, what I will say about the DNA methylation is that uh, it it's the most strongly validated in the clinical research um, in terms How of- so? So uh, there was a really, really cool review article that was uh, uh, published, um, I, I want to say in 2020, but it looked at all of the different uh, biological tests that have been purported to predict aging. Uh, and when they created a scatter plot of uh, how well does this correlate with um, various health markers that we know are affected through aging, things like cardiovascular disease, all cause mortality. Uh, and then they also plot against the, the number of studies that have investigated it. DNA methylation uh, currently has the most research showing it alongside the, the best correlation efficiency, much more than, than telomere length. Um, the only thing that is potentially superior to it but which simply does not have the robustness of data to yet support it because the studies uh, are, are just now starting to pick up is looking at a variety of metabolic health markers and then creating like equations from that to right. predict someone's age. 
Um, but for, you know, as simple as it is looking at key uh, regions on, on the DNA and the amount of methylation that has been conducted, uh, it is a really good predictor of biological age to where um, if you want to get a, a test to see how did a supplement impact uh, basically the risk of somebody dying prematurely, then that that would be a test to get done. Uh, and you could say, um, you could say, hey, you know, if we do nothing, my health right now, I might be like me personally, uh, I'm 30 years old. So, okay, chronologically, I'm 30 years old. Biologically, you know, maybe I am 26. And if I take the supplement, wow, now, you know, it's been a couple months, but now I'm 25 or 24. It's like, this is clearly uh, benefiting my long-term health. I have a higher likelihood of living longer and living healthier over that time period. And, and, and uh, so you're, you're saying that the methylation is tested against how healthy people are overall and, and their overall so in, mortality? So in, in the, the research on that is used to validate DNA methylation, what they do is they look at a variety of disease endpoints. Uh, so a variety of morbidities, things like cardiovascular disease, um, the risk of developing type 2 diabetes or having a heart attack or even dying from a variety of things uh, or just dying overall um, and developing neurodegeneration, whatever. And they look at how does the risk change as the uh, biological age of someone, which is determined by right. DNA relation, increase. And you show a very consistent increase in the risk, uh, one that often either matches or exceeds the predictive ability of someone's chronological age. And so uh, the researchers basically, you know, the easiest way to describe it is this is why you could have two people that are both 60 years old. Uh, one of them needs to go into a nursing home and the other is still running triathlons or whatever. Um, DNA methylation is a really simple way to, to look at that level of health. Although, uh, like I said earlier, um, the upcoming test that seems to be even more superior, we just need more research validating its use, is looking at a variety of metabolic health markers. And so this would be like a cluster of things uh, related to metabolic health, like insulin sensitivity or related as well to fitness, like someone's VO2 um, max. Uh, right. Have you taken this uh, true age test? No. No, I personally haven't. And it's just because I, I don't have a reason for doing it. I just haven't. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> I mean, the way, the way I like to kind of approach longevity is actually more with DNA. And I'll give you an example, right? Like there's studies a lot, like I'll, I'll look at a, Men a Mendelian randomization studies, right? And you're familiar with those, I, I, yep. I would assume, right? So like if you look at one of the benefits, we were talking about glycine, one of the benefits of glycine, I said it's actually people who have higher blood levels of glycine, for example, have um are, are are more likely to live longer, right? Lower mortality, whatever it is, right? Uh, especially cardiovascular mortality. And so there was some Mendelian randomization studies for that. Now the great thing is that so in something like self decode, you can actually look at whether you have higher or lower glycine. So whether you need like whether you're predisposed to higher or lo lower levels of blood glycine, and if you're predisposed to like so. The way that we d display it currently is just like typical need for glycine or higher need, right? So if you have lower, then you're going to come up with you have a higher need for glycine. And maybe you'll, you'll take glycine anyway, right? But if you have a genetic predisposition for lower glycine, then it would become more important for somebody like that to take glycine. And so I kind of, uh, I do that across the board for amino acids or, uh, or I do it for uh, obviously all kinds of nutrients, 
Um, but there's really like tons of things that like tons of bits of information that you can get from your genetics that, and, and, and you can also see where you're at high risk for. So for example, I think like the biggest factor for longevity is actually atherosclerosis, right? Because 50% of people, according to the uh, NIH, die either directly or indirectly from artery hardening, atherosclerosis. So, I mean, that's a huge number, 50% of yeah. people in the advanced world, which is pretty much, you know, U.S., Western Europe, things like that, di are dying from uh, atherosclerosis. There's a test that says if you are high genetic risk for atherosclerosis, and if you are, mm -hmm. guess what? There's, you know, there's tons of things you could do for that, right? There's yeah. Tons. And so that test alone in self-decode, right, that, that result is worth, in my opinion, way more than all these other tests combined just because, okay, you got this methylation test, you got this. If you can tell what your risk, is, like your genetic predisposition is for atherosclerosis. And so my sister, she had in the, uh, was in, I think it was the 96th percentile. And then we, I was, like, we took a, 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 like her blood markers Everything was just through the roof, like her LDL, whatever. I was oh. like, look, you got high genetic risk for atherosclerosis and yeah. you've got all your blood markers with this thing. Like you really better get your shit together, right? Like yeah. every single test she took was like HSCRP, blood glucose. Like the whole thing was just everything was elevated. And I wouldn't say like she even, you know, eats that unhealthy. She's like, you know, I feel fine. I was like, you're headed for a heart attack at, at 40, yeah. right? Or 50, or whatever it is. <laughs> like, it, it's just, and she's just like, you know, I feel fine, right? There's no problem. Yeah, there's no, you might have, you know, you might feel fine, but based on your lab markers and based on your genetic predisposition, uh, I mean, it's a recipe for disaster. And and you don't need to use drugs if you're young, right? Obviously, like if, if you, you can obviously uh, work with your lifestyle and then, that's why we have the lab analyzer there so that you could just upload your labs easily and just see what is suboptimal so that you could then work on it. So for like the atherosclerosis, you have all different, we show you all the lab markers that you can check and see if those are in the optimal range. If they are, then even if your risk is higher, you're still going to be, you could still lower your risk more than most of the population just by yeah. getting your numbers. So the way I see like, all these tests are interesting. I actually did a methylation test just because I feel like I got to do every test and take every supplement. But, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I actually, uh, uh, somebody also gave that to me for, for free. Um, and you know, uh, so I've got my, uh, you know, biological age here. I took it at 32 and then my biological age was 30. Um, yeah, I actually awesome. got way more into fitness and health recently in the past like year just because um i you know i like i i was kind of very very focused on building self-decode and then i was like hey i should be using this more <laughs> and yes. i'm like starting, <laughs> like yeah. now i'm using it all the time I'm like oh this is great i got new lab tests i'm like uploading them i'm looking at oh and every lab test you could look at what's your predisposition for higher you could see is it is it higher so you could see if you're more genetically inclined and I, I've got like my lab tests measured for 11 years. So I could see how things are changing over time. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and you, you, you're not able to do that. I don't, I don't know anywhere else you could do that. So it's like um, you're getting like, it's just the whole ecosystem. And so I think that's way more effective just than uh, these tests. And each of these tests is like many hundreds of dollars. Oh, Whereas yeah, yeah. The genetic test you're getting everything like you get all these things for uh you know a much more affordable like a, it's you know it, it's um i mean there's a cost but then you get like 250 reports instead of just one report yes. literally all i got was your result it doesn't tell me how to change it or what the hell is going on right it's just like chronological yep. age is 32 your biological age is 30 thank you very much now what do i do right and that's yeah. probably like a few hundred dollar test. And I'm just like, uh, okay, right? What's okay, cool. <laughs> you know, good to know. Um, but that's kind of like why I think I think all these tests are interesting, but it's like, 
you know, it's cheaper just to look at your testosterone, you know, just see where your testosterone's at, yeah. see where it's, how it's changing. I want you to try to list 10 supplements that you take, you know, consciously. Let's see okay. if you can get to 10. All right, go. <laughs> Not, well, wait, wait, do you want me to include the two I already said or go from there? Uh, so you said glycine and creatine, right? Okay, so collagen, creatine, taurine, maca, a potassium citrate, alpha GPC, a vitamin K2, vitamin A in the form of retinol, vitamin D, uh, calcium D glucarate, um, garlic, uh, coenzyme. That's pretty good. And I have no oh. idea what number I'm at right now. Um, I, 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 lo I think you're at 12 or something. I lost count. <laughs> That's pretty good, though. You, you passed 10. I know a lot of questions. I got some questions on, on some of it. Why do you take uh, calcium d instead of, let's say, uh, I'm, 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 I'm asking this because I was thinking about it. Calcium d instead of indole 3 carbonyl or DIM? Uh, I take DIM, too. I was trying to okay. think of that one. Uh, I, I couldn't remember okay. the acronym, though. But why do you spot. take uh, calcium d and, and do you think, uh, like, out of those three, I uh, indole three carbonyl versus dim? So indole three carbonyl converts to dim. And um, like, why would you take? I, I assume you're trying to reduce estrogen. That's correct. Okay. So I started taking those uh, because I used exogenous testosterone, and oh, so okay, I I uh, just I've never uh, used. Um, it to do any form of like physique or competitive bodybuilding or uh like doing those those incredibly high doses uh but i did take 100 milligrams of exogenous testosterone per week uh just to enhance my amount of lean body mass that i had um and i started that at the very end of uh, uh my wife's pregnancy uh are you still taking it? Year. Nope. I'm off because my, my wife and I want to have a second child. And uh, so I've been off of it now for about a month and I've been using HCG injections to kickstart my own testosterone production back up. Uh, I wonder, oh, what was your testosterone before you started taking testosterone? 570. Okay. Total. And, and you thought that that wasn't like, that wasn't optimal for you. I thought it, I, I, it was fine. I had no symptoms at all of, of having Rotate. too little testosterone, but um, exogenous testosterone uh, simply, there isn't a lifestyle thing that can be done to match the, both the extent and the quickness through which you experience the effects of that on lean tissue growth. Uh, when I started taking that, I, I gained uh, about... 20 pounds, I jumped up from 190 to 210. Uh, wow. Any other change? Um, really. And what is your, when you yeah. test your testosterone now in your blood, what is it? So I haven't tested it uh, since I came off the testosterone. I wanted to get some cycles of the HCG completed and then do a full hormone panel to also see where my luteinizing hormone and the such are at. Uh, when I was on the testosterone, uh, my total was at about 1200. Um, and that's at a hundred milligrams of testosterone. Yeah. But also so keep in mind, this was testing, uh, uh, five days after the injection and the half-life is eight days. So it probably pushed me up to around 2,500, uh, mm. with, uh, so even a low dosage. That's kind of, I was, I was wondering about that. People who are taking testosterone. Yeah. Like they, uh, what was Liver King at? I think he was at 120 milligrams. Yeah, he was. And he, you know, he did actual steroid cycles where he probably bumped it up to 600, which is standard for that, uh, because he called it a cruise dose. And uh, people don't cruise on something unless they've done a higher one. Uh, plus, you can't achieve the body Liver King has without uh, these absurdly high doses. And what I'm do you mean? You just eat raw liver. Yes, for a, a, I wish. Um, that would be amazing. Or or better yet, you just got to eat testicles. Testicles, yeah. I yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> His little catchphrase gets me every time. Why eat a vegetable when you could eat a testicle? Well, right. lots of reasons. But... Right, right. Fiber, bunch of phytonutrients. <laughs> and, and just the fact that you wouldn't need to eat a testicle. Right. Uh, but yeah. Um, Have you ever eaten a testicle? No, but uh, I I studied abroad during my under under my undergrad was in accountant. Uh, um, I don't even know what the word is accountancy. Uh, okay. But my undergrad was to be an accountant, and I studied abroad in Chengdu, China, for a semester when I did that. And um, I I I want to say that I took a bite off of a sheep penis at at some point, but I never ate testicle. Um, worst thing I've ever eaten though, was, was silkworm. I think it was silkworm. It was some, one of those bugs that's like mm. around and you bite into it and it like gooshes. That had to be the most disgusting thing I ever ate when I was over there. That was one bite and I'm done. Um, I just ate testicle this past weekend. It actually wasn't bad. It, it tastes pretty good. Um, no, I, yeah, it depend on what testicle you're tasting. Like what liver yeah. king has up. I mean, those are like you know, rhinoceros testicles or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the ones I've got are like chicken testicles. <laughs> oh, not okay. Bad. Well, and I, and they're not, they're not raw. They're cooked. Yeah. I'm sure that impacts it a lot. Um, so, but yeah, getting so back I started to, taking okay. yeah, the sorry. DIM and the, the calcium D glucarnate, uh, as a means to help maintain normal estrogen levels while I was using exogenous testosterone. And did uh, that work? Yeah. Yeah. My estrogen, the highest I ever got was, I think, 36. Um, despite uh, the total testosterone, I uh, easily probably hit like 2,000 to 2,500 milligrams wow. uh, in the day after taking it, although I never tested. But I did have a, a friend who started using 100 milligrams. He tested the day after, and it was like 2,200. So I'm guessing it probably peaks around there. And then it's a steady decline by five days. I was after five days or five days after injecting, I was at 1200, which is, puts me in the 99th percentile for men my age. Um, How old are you? 30. Okay. So you, by lifestyle alone, you're probably up there in the, around the 99th percentile too. I mean, here, here's just an example. I just want to show you. So you see my free testosterone here. This is where I got three markers. One was in 2018, 2019, 2022. And so here, 2018, it's 7.44, right? You could see it yeah. here. And like I was into health, just not like I am now. Then I, 2019, I got more into it. Um, and you see my... It, it, it was kind of like normal. Now, I, also, after I saw this result, I think I was like, "Oh shit, my free T is low. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta wake up a little bit here." Um, and so I took it. You know, I took it sometime later. Got a, a normal result, and then I've just been super into health for like the past six months, and now it's just like off the charts. But I, I don't think it's it's bad off the charts. It's just um, quite high. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's super impressive. Um, and this is the total T, by the way. You could see, like, it's going down. And then yeah. as I'm getting healthier, it's just shooting up here. Yeah, wow. Yeah. That's really so cool. That, that's really that's convenient really, to see. Yeah, that is. The, the um, uh, just, like, the trends. And then, obviously, you could click on any of them and, and, and see, like, how to improve it and things like that. But... When you take testosterone, do you feel like, oh, I got more energy this day or uh, my workouts are better or you don't really notice anything? I would say the biggest difference uh, when I stopped taking it is that um, I maintained my strength in the gym, but I definitely uh, get fatigued more easily. So if I'm, I'm, I'm pushing the same amount of weight because my muscle mass and my strength haven't changed. Uh, you know, testosterone doesn't acutely increase someone's strength or any of that, but it helps you build more muscle. If you come off of it, you still have that muscle. Um, yeah. 
so I, that stayed the same, but I was much more tired and I needed more rest kind of between my sets. Uh, and, um, even if my peak strength was similar, my strength kind of declined as the workout progressed due to the onset of fatigue. Uh, I, I can't say I have, I have not noticed any changes to, um, things like libido or, uh, mood. Uh, those okay. did not change when I came off of the testosterone. But my, my wife doesn't really want me to go back on the testosterone, uh, oh, when, oh, uh, we have the, our, our second child, um, because <clears throat> testosterone levels in males after a child is born, uh, naturally decline, uh, mm. quite significantly. And the evolutionary rationale for this is that, uh, the lower testosterone promotes better bonding with the offspring. And so, uh, I mean, I, I feel pretty bonded to, to my son, but, uh, she just wants me to like, wait until, you know, the second one is older. Uh, so maybe I think if you wanted to convince her, I, I think like a lower test, like higher testosterone is, is better for monogamy. <laughs> yeah. So that's, I, I read a study on that. So, you know. Like, all right, I'll lower my testosterone, but I can't promise I'll be faithful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there. <laughs> You'd probably just say, okay, well, as long as I remain head of the household or whatever, <laughs> you can go have fun. Right. So she's also into all this stuff. I mean, you mentioned oh, yeah. before the call that she, she, um, she, uh, you know, she, she uses self decode. I just remember yep. now. No, but, she, uh, uh, the way you talk about, how you approach things for yourself, uh, reminds me very heavily of how she does it. Um, because she, she started learning about all these things in the same way that you did, where she had like health goals and then mm. she would look into supplements that could help with that and then start going down all these rabbit holes. And, and, you know, now she, she takes like a shit ton, like over 50 supplements. Um, oh, wow. And and some of them, it's like she doesn't take all of those every day. You know, some of them are targeted uh, for when she needs them for some specific thing or whatever. But yeah, the way and you how does she about, does it does it help her a lot? Like, does she notice oh, yeah. good benefits? Well, here's here's an example. Um, she found that five HTP was super beneficial for her mood uh, and helping her not have a generally pessimistic outlook. Same um, here. She ran, <laughs> she ran your self decode and she has like every polymorphism possible in serotonin that that's same sweet. here. I have a lot of polymorphism. Yeah. It's, it's and same. So it's, she it's heavily genetic explanation to, to explain why she gets so much benefit from five HTP. Um, also for her sleep because serotonin turns into melatonin. Same uh, thing here yeah. for her sleep. Um, so before so yeah, I was she, taking five HTP, I couldn't sleep for like over, I don't know, a certain amount of time without waking up. Yeah. It was just like yeah, that I was her. couldn't do it. Yeah. It, it's so, it, it's so amazing. Cause it's just like, and, and you see a lot of people that are just, you know, they, they can't like, they have that same problem, but they don't know that, Hey, maybe, you know, if, if you're having some anxiety and you're not, you're waking up in the middle of the night, probably has to do with serotonin, right? It's a good yep. chance. And, yep. um, you know, so these kinds of things, it, your genetics can pick up. And uh, th that's why it's like, I think that's a, I think it's definitely a game changer. Genetics, lab tests, um, also the amount of lab tests that we can check. It yeah. just went up tremendously from, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, right? And, yeah, and data... I'm still amazed that a lot of lab tests aren't used more commonly. Uh, and it's kind of annoying, uh, you know, when you consider something like, um, what's a good example of this? Uh, I think most insurance companies will only pay for one vitamin D test per year as an example. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, like I, I would think, you know, to reduce your own costs, you would want to pay for a couple more vitamin D tests to make sure these people like get their levels up, uh, given that. What it forty two percent of the U.S. population is deficient. Um, 
So things like that or not covering uh, homocysteine like, oh, well, that's not a preventive test. Like, are you kidding me? You know how important homocysteine is? Um, I have a list of like 200 markers that are like really important for a bunch of, you know, it's like very important. Um, you can't get them tested or like you're going to pay through the roof yeah. Uh, yeah, if you exactly. get them tested. Like even when I had insurance in the U.S., they weren't paying for these tests. I had to yeah, pay out I of know. pocket it's, for them. It's frustrating. Uh, and so we we actually sell these tests uh, on self decode, but it's like if you want to do all of them, like I'm I'm again I'm doing like 200 of them, and I'm not in the U.S., so currently we only sell in the U.S. But um, if you want to do all of them, it's just super expensive. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm like I'm leading a trip to India where it's like this whole resort you get everything included hotel meal and they're doing all of these tests and like way more every test you can think of they're doing right and that's kind of how i'm doing it so i'm like trying to get as many as i can from my doctor <laughs> and then I'm, I'm getting like this super comprehensive panel as quickly you know as often as possible and i think that i mean look if you're just somebody regular, you don't need to get them every three months like I'm trying to get it. I'm, I would like to, if I could, I would get it every week just because I'm doing a lot of experiments. So I want to see how's the yeah. supplement interacting, how's that. So I'm trying to do it as often as possible. But if you're more just like, I'm, you know, I just want my five supplements a day or 10, and I'm going to do that for the next 20 years, then you should check that. You, you see, make sure, check your numbers and see like, okay. My kidney function is good. My liver function, you know, my LDL, whatever, just like a lot of these main markers. And then, you know, if nothing drastic is changing, your your labs are probably not going to drastically change in a year anyway, right? For my labs, they, they drastically yeah. change because I'm doing different stuff, right? I could like change, like I could, you know, change my supplement regimen. But if you're, you know, most people I think are more or less consistent with what they're doing. Yeah. And so... You don't, you know, once a year is probably fine. And, uh, you know, as long as you're not like doing anything crazy like me, it, it's probably fine. You know, you don't, you don't need it every well, I, uh, couple months. Yeah. And I think there's grades too, uh, in terms of like most people just need to focus on some really, really basic stuff. Whereas you're, you're, you're like working at an advanced level to really dial in a lot of nuance with your own personal health. For sure. And, you know, most people are like 40% of people are still deficient in vitamin D. <laughs> like, you know, they just, they need to focus on all these little small things. A handful of blood tests is really all they need to start getting their life back on track and making changes to, you know, reverse metabolic syndrome, lose some body fat. I uh, get, you know, a variety of overarchingly important health markers uh, in check, like, blood lipids, homocysteine, vitamin D, uh, CRP, things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, I'm trying to really dial in a whole bunch of areas and I'm trying to live to like, I don't know, 100 according to the current technology, probably 150 in with the future technology. Um, and I think that, you know, and I, and I want to do that healthy. So that's kind of my goal. Yeah. 100 healthy the whole time. But, uh, you know, people just, most people, I feel like they want to live to like, I don't know, 80 and they're cool with that. <laughs> and, or I yeah. don't know, you know, it's like, oh, I got some issues. But uh, anyway, we've uh, we've gone overboard. We've gone over time. But um, I feel like, uh, you know, we, we, we got through quite a bit and I uh, really appreciate uh, the chat today. Yeah, it was a lot of fun for me and I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, definitely. I had fun as well. And so, uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, is there anything that you would like to promote or, you know, uh, where where can people find you? Well, uh, anyone can find me at my website, which is just my name.com. So alexleaf.com. Uh, you can also find a lot of my work at theenergyblueprint.com, um, including supplements that I uh, co-formulated alongside Ari Witten. Uh, and if you need new reading material, then just earlier this year, uh, Eat for Energy was published with Hay House. So you can go read that to learn how to increase uh, your energy levels with food. 
and nutrition. And stay tuned for the second book, which is all about using hormetic stress to extend your lifespan and your health span. Awesome. Cool. All right. Thanks for coming on. Have a great day. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Take care. Take care. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show, so please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, all while helping to keep us ad-free. 